All right. If y'all want, you can turn to your, in your Bibles to Romans chapter 14. That's um, Romans 14 through Romans chapter 15, verse uh, 7. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. Um, I will not be here next week. Um, Jonathan's going to be filling in for me. And um, so I thought this would be a, a really good Sunday to do one of those kind of housekeeping sermons. You know, there's, there's sermons you got to preach a couple of times throughout the year, you know. Um, and what Romans 14 and 15 really deal with is how to actually get along in the church, um, how the church is one body, um, redeemed by Christ, can have different opinions, can see things different ways, right, and have different thoughts on things, and yet still be able to um, join arms for the good of the gospel, for the good of the kingdom, and learn to agree to disagree in a way that honors Christ, in a way that um, provoke, promotes thanksgiving to God for what he's done for us in Christ. And that's what Romans 14 and 15 are about. Really great passages of scripture. Um, let's pray, and then we'll just jump right in together. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for its ability to build us up. Lord, I know that at times we're strong and at times we're weak in Christ. Um, there are times where we despise other people that hold different opinions than we do. And there are times that we pass judgment on people that, that when they partake in freedoms that we don't see as freedoms. And um, we're just thankful that we serve a God that is mighty and that's powerful and who has demonstrated ultimately um, your great strength you've demonstrated in Christ Jesus, Lord. And what he did through the resurrection, his resurrection from the dead, God, and, and how that applies to our lives and just our everyday conversations and our, um, as we think through the things that, um, as we think through the things that, that pull on our consciences, as we think through things that we don't always agree on, that we can come to you, who's the great unifier of all things in Christ, and that, um, and that you impart wisdom to us. And I pray that we would walk in that wisdom, that we would receive what you've imparted to us through Christ today, through his death, through his resurrection, and that we would be able to, as a church, to live in harmony, even when we just have to agree to, to disagree, God. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, you know, when you read Romans chapter 14, you're always looking for some sort of comp. You know, if you're not familiar with what a comp is, it's a comparable. Like, what's a comparable situation to, you know, eating meat? and not eating meat, celebrating a, a Jewish holiday, not celebrating Jewish holiday. And unfortunately, um, I'm, I'm not on social media, and so I don't know what the Christian world is necessarily up in arms about at this very moment. Um, it's safe to say the Christian world seems to find itself up in arms a lot, um, and most of the time against itself. <laughs> so I'm sure there's something that's going on, right, where you can get on Facebook and you're like, oh, this is what the Christians have decided to fight about amongst themselves. I, th I think a really good comp to this, um, and it may not be as, you know, relevant as an example, is maybe the chosen. Um, I think that that's probably a decent comp because um, there's all sorts of, I call them loopers when it comes to the chosen. You know, the chosen is the TV show that, that sets the, you know, that's according to the, to the gospel, to the Bible. Um, I call them loopers. And so you have one group of Christians who thinks that the chosen is going to be on an endless loop in hell. And you have another group of Christians who think that the chosen is going to be on an endless loop in heaven, right? And then you have some of the people in the middle who are just generally out of the loop. And they don't really know what's going on with any of it or why everyone's so upset. And that's a really good way to kind of look at things. I mean, um, because you see it play out, right, in that particular conversation. You have some people over here that can't believe people actually watch it. And you got the people over here that don't, and they can't believe that there are Christians who can't believe that Christians would do anything but watch it. And then there are people in the middle, like I talked to one Christian who said, I just thought the acting wasn't that good, so I couldn't get past the first, the first episode. And that's, that's just the way it is, right? And so what, what Romans 14 does is it calls us to, um, to really, Matt mentioned earlier in his communion, you know, you, you don't have to look further than the mirror to really get the answer to, to a lot of things. And that's what Romans 14 actually 
helps us do, all right? This is what it says. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. And so um, we welcome one another, not necessarily with the purpose of changing someone else's viewpoint to match my own. That's not the, that's not the idea around behind welcoming. We're going to welcome everybody here, and then we're going to train them to think the way that we think, and then when they all think the way that we think, then we can really welcome them, right? That's, so Paul, <laughs> that's what he means, not to quarrel over opinions. And this is a really interesting choice of words here because what he's going to do is he's going to take a theological debate that's happening in the church that people feel really strongly about. And Paul basically says from the outset, well, that's just your opinion. That's a really interesting category to have. We don't necessarily like that category, especially when we believe something with great fervor, right? Especially when we believe something that's the right thing. We don't like it to be our opinion. We would rather it be some sort of maxim or some sort of truth. And Paul enters a conversation saying, we're not going to quarrel about something that's just your opinion. It's just an opinion. And so he enters, he brings in a category that when we're fussing with each other, we don't often bring to the picture. And that's the category of opinion. When we're arguing with one another or when we're having some sort of discussion, we bring the category of right, wrong, innocent, guilty, offended, offender, right? We bring all those categories, but there's one that we don't usually bring, and that's the category of opinion. It's one of the first ones Paul brings up. We're we're talking about opinions here. And what he says next is remarkable. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. Let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It's before his own master that he stands or falls. And he will be upheld for the Lord is able to make him stand. So the argument's really concise. It's packed in there. And it goes pretty much like this. Um, You know, we're we're talking about ceremonial laws of of purification and and those things. Um, It's remarkable. There's there's a, a massive migration that's occurred with the advent of the gospel, right? From ceremonial law code to the conscience of the individual. And it's, and it's, it, is, it is a massive shift because you look at other world religions and they mandate things like what you can eat and what you can drink, what is clean and what is unclean, what holy day you celebrate and when you celebrate it, right? That, that's, that's religion 101. If you take enough, Survey of World Religions course. And what, what Paul is pointing to is, here is a migration from, from that type of religion and way of thinking to a matter of the heart, uh, to the matter of personal conscience, to the matter of having a, com- a conviction about something that's right or wrong. And he's going he's gonna to delineate that a little bit further as, 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 it, as it goes on. But the first thing he wants us to know is, number one, we have an opinion, and number two, we don't really have the right to judge our beloved who just love the chosen. They're not your servant. That's what Paul would say. They don't answer to you. It's not before you that they stand or fall as you're, some, as you're you know, like you're the judge or the, the harbinger or arbiter of truth, right? It's, they serve someone else. We all do. That's the first point Paul makes is that, you know, we got to get ourselves in the right place here. You know, we're we're acting like a lawgiver that states things from above that are facts, right? Like, don't listen to Bethel. They're bad. Bethel equals bad. That's an opinion. That's an opinion. And and, and he says, look, if we're going to talk about this, there may be a better, best category. There may be a, I, I like those categories better, helpful more helpful, least helpful. I think those categories are a lot more helpful than equals bad, right? And so Paul says, 
hold up a second here. It doesn't take long. It, there's not much space between giving your opinion and being a judge or a lawgiver. I mean, it's just like this much difference. It's so close. And he says, we've we got to slow down a second. The, the, we're not to pass judgment on the servant of another. It's before his own master that he stands or falls. And he'll be upheld for the Lord's able to make him stand. One person esteems one day better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. This, is, this, is a, this passage right here is flabbergasting to me. It's remarkable. It's, I mean, just take Judaism, for example. You, you, don't get through the, you don't get through the Torah, right? You don't get through the Pentateuch without understanding that there are festival days that are to be celebrated, and we know when they're to be celebrated. And if you don't celebrate them, you violate the law, right? I mean, when Paul's writing this letter, I mean, we're, we're probably, what, maybe 30 years past that? In the history of, like, religion, or, you know, Christianity is a, it's a Jewish religion early on. So imagine that you're told, right? that you have to esteem a certain day. It's part of the fabric of who you are. It's part of being a Jew. So not only is it part of your religion, it's part of your, the fabric of your, of your, of your moral compass and your, and your identity as a group of people. And then you have someone saying, well, yeah, some people esteem this day higher than the others. Be fully. Con what matters the most, however, is not whether or not you esteem one day higher than the next. It's that you be fully convinced about whether or not you're going to esteem it in your own mind. That is new stuff. Unheard of. That's why I talk about the migration from the law, right, to the Holy Spirit and the gospel that's written on the heart. That is, that's one of the mind-blowing things about Christianity as a religion, right? It's food laws consist of, yeah, don't eat anything strangled or blood, right? Okay, well, that's easy enough. They gathered on the first day of the week to, bear, to break bread. I mean, but th that's, that is, we go from all of the commandments in the Old Testament to that, to let each one of you be fully convinced of it in your own mind, which means that it's actually okay for you to have an opinion, right? It's okay, it's okay to be on one of the loops here. If, 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 you know, we're going to use the chosen as our example. If the chosen didn't choose you, that's okay. Have really good reasons as to why you're not going to do it. And and test, right, you're not going to partake in it, test it against Scripture, test it against your conscience, grow in that process, give yourself room to change your mind, and then hold to your conviction. That's the mature thing to do. Because your mind probably will change as you, as you're, as you grow. And, and it's, that's the, one of the wonderful things about Christianity is, is it gives room for the Holy Spirit in, the, in, in someone's own conscience to work in harmony and concert with itself to actually progress and to grow. And so you're not set with a set of... It's different for the person. Believe it or not. That's what, this is the conclusion Paul's going to come to as we finish reading. It's different. For some people, man, it's... Eat the meat all day long. And some people don't need to touch it. It just depends. Right? That, that's the, it depends on that person. All right. The one who observes the day, so what Paul does is he takes, this is a brilliantly written section here, because he takes absolute opposites and collapses them together and shows the similarity between the two. One person esteems one day is better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. 
The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. And so what we have here is something that's more important than whether I watch it or don't, whether I eat it or don't, whether I celebrate it or don't. What's important is that whether by life or by death in my body, I'm going to live in a way that glorifies Christ and produces thanksgiving that honors his name. That's the point of the Christian life. It's not whether we do or don't. It's, it's whether or not we can experience a oneness or in a wholeness with our Lord that, that manifests itself and demonstrates itself in a manner of thanksgiving and a praise and of a life that seeks to honor Christ in, in our doing or in our abstaining. That's what matters. That's the great equalizer of it all. That's what Paul's saying. There's something deeper to it than, than thou shalt or thou shalt not. And, and you get to the point here, right? And, and this is what Paul's doing here is it's really hard to, I mean, there's all sorts of things you could, you could apply it to. You could maybe apply it to instrumental music. Um, you could apply this kind of thinking maybe to Bethel and Hillsong. I know some Christians are really, you know, frustrated about like, what, are we going to sing a Bethel song or we're going to sing a Sovereign Grace song or we're we going to sing a contemporary song or we're we going to sing a hymn. Most of the time when, um, I think people with a high degree, high degree of disagreeability tend to have those conversations more than conscientious people who want everybody to get along. I think that's a sign you're probably highly disagreeable if you have those conversations. But nevertheless, I, I bring that up because what Paul's saying here is easy to read, but it's extremely difficult to actually do. It's difficult to actually think about it this way. Because we don't understand why those blockheads on the other side of the fence can't get it together. What's wrong with this show? What's wrong with you? That's the way we think about it. And then when presented with the evidence of, you know, this is what's wrong with the show, we go, they're hopeless. <laughs> right? But we don't think about it the way that Paul does. It's easy, to, it's easy to read. But what Paul is saying here is that you can, on some issues, now we're not talking thou shalt not murder. You can't come down on the other side of the fence of that one. But there are ritualistic issues, ceremonial parts of the law. I mean, there are some issues that you can actually land on the other side of the fence on. And Paul says that both people no matter what side of the fence they're on, can both glorify God. And they actually think completely differently from one another. Now, how does that work, right? Because if you're anything like me, I know exactly how what I think, glor think, what I think glorifies God. And if you think like I do, then it's really easy for me to go, and you do too, right? What we really have trouble thinking is how in the world can a worship band that releases glitter from the ceiling and call it the gold dust of God's glory, how can they do it ever? Well, that's a good question, right? What? And Paul says, None of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. So he brings up, he, he goes from people that have different opinions on things, and they both can honor God in some way, and he goes, and, and, the, and the conundrum we have in our mind is, how does that work? How do opposites glorify the same thing? And Paul says, consider, I don't know, death and life. None of us lives to himself. None of us dies to himself. But if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord, of, Lord both of the dead and of the living. 
So what Paul is saying here is, is don't be so sure that somebody that holds a completely opposite view of you is incapable of glorifying God. After all, if God can take two completely opposite realities like death and life and make them both serve one purpose, well, he probably can handle the chosen and he definitely can handle Bethel or Hillsong. He's got it. He makes death and life serve him. And there's nothing more opposite than that. That's what Paul says. And so what Paul does is it's really remarkable. He takes his theology, because that's what we're talking about here, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and he brings it into the area of praxis or practicalities and goes, this actually does impact the way that we can get along with one another as long as we can remember it. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord, both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? All right, so he's talking to the, these are the anti-chosen people. Because that's what, that's what the, the people that are anti don't do it. They're, they're called weaker by Paul, and they are called, they are said to be more likely to be judgmental. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or you? The guy that gives money to the show every month so that they continue to create it. Why do you despise your brother? <laughs> and then he says, there's a great commonality here. Ready? He takes us all somewhere. For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it's written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. You answer, here's the way, so here's the way it works. I'm going to answer for me. And Jackson's going to answer for Jackson, right? And Jonathan's going to answer for Jonathan. And when you can actually get yourself in front of the judgment seat, something really remarkable happens. Namely, when you can put yourself in front of the judgment seat of Christ, you, you actually get out of his judgment seat. And that's a really good thing to remember. Another way to put it is, why do you try to get the speck out of your brother's eye when you have a log in your own? First remove the log out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the eye out of your, the speck out of your brother's. It's the same concept, right? It's this, the, the teaching is identical. It's, all right, let's get the right person seated in the right place, and I'll let the Lord sit there, and then I'll come over here. And there we go. And then we start looking at our own convictions. That's where we should be. Being fully convinced of our, in our own minds is actually enough work in and of itself. Because it takes a lot of work to be convinced in your own mind of something. And he says, let's do that. Therefore, since we're all going to give an account of ourselves to God, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer. This is chapter 14, verse 13. But rather, we're going to decide something different. We're going to decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. Oh, now that's different. So here's what it means. You know, and I use the chosen. We did that for a small group a while back. We actually had a non-chosen small group. So I said other small groups were for the chosen people. And then we had a non-chosen small group. And we did that so that we didn't put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. And it had nothing to do with what we thought we knew as leaders of the church or as elders. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but 
We do know this. It is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. Which means that instead of deciding, you know, it's not my job to figure out why my brother is a whatever, you know, slow, obtuse, ignorant, whatever you want to call it. That's, that's not my, that's, it's not my responsibility to figure out and to point out who needs changing around here. It's my job to, to know where they are. Okay, I know that about you. What do I do with that knowledge then? I decide that I'm not going to put anything in your way to make you stumble. That would include offering something for the entire church and then encouraging and berating the brother that's offended with the thing or sister that's offended with the thing going, well, I just don't know why you can't get over this. I mean, it's just nothing. I just think this is... Be- that, Paul says, all right, we're going to decide not to do that. We're going to honor someone else's convictions. Oh, okay. If your brother is grieved by what you eat, uh, I'm sorry, I know I'm persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks that it is. That's wild stuff right there. The law told us what was unclean. Now, the law sets up shop in someone's heart. And if it declares it unclean to the person, it is thus unclean. That's wild. That is, I don't think we grasp how unique this is in our religion. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking or doing so whether we watch the chosen or abstain from it, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it's wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It's good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So there is the barometer there. Can you do it from faith? Can you do it from a place of wholeness? Or does the action produce a divide or a divisiveness in yourself? That's where the whole thing, that's where Paul is telling everyone to look. Are you okay with it? Are you okay with it? It doesn't matter if Mary Lou is. Are you? That's what matters. Why are you okay? Why are you not okay with it? Where does it come from? Accept, can you accept it as it is? Is it from faith? That's what that phrase from from faith means. Now, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, The reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. And he says this, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice 
glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. So there's a definition of welcome one another, right? That he begins with in chapter 14 and ends with in verse 7. Welcoming one another as we've been welcomed means that there is going to be inevitably differences of opinion, differences of belief, differences of conviction. And what Paul says here is is that we don't aim to snuff them all out and bring it into absolute, you know, uniformity and then present it to the Lord. Paul says this, there's a way to go about our differences of opinion and our differences of belief that actually embody the, the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's, there's a way to go about disagreeing to agree and agreeing to disagree, or however you put it, that actually mirrors Christ dying and being raised again so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. And he says, when you work out differences that way, you actually manifest in the congregation, in the assembly, for everyone to see something that's truly unique about Yahweh and his son Christ. That there's a uniqueness in what he does in his death, burial, and resurrection that, that takes opposite realities like death and life and make them both serve him and make them both praise him. And when you can take that cosmic view of what he does in life and death and you can apply it to the chosen, then you actually do the cosmic thing on earth. And God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. And we get this wonderful symmetry of what happens in heaven and what happens on earth, and it's brought into oneness and wholeness in Christ. And it's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. And, and with one voice, we glorify God our Father. And that, that's, where the uni, that's where the uniformity comes from in Romans 14 through chapter 15, is glorifying God the Father. That's the uniformity of it. And there's a way to do it that accounts for everyone's consciences, that accounts for differences of opinion and differences of belief. And when the church works towards that, it grows. Now that's the, there's maturity that happens. We grow into Christ's likeness. And, and, there's, there's, and once again, we see what? We see this, this idea of praise through thanksgiving, you know. That's beautiful. It's like this. We were privileged to go see Disney on Ice, blessed to go see Disney on Ice yesterday. And apart from, you know, some of the shoddy choreography, um, for those of you who don't know, I really enjoy figure skating. Um, you know, I, I don't know why, but I've always enjoyed it. I've enjoyed, you know, the technical part of it. The, and so we got Frozen, Let It Go, and it's just one of the poorest, I mean, if there's ever a song that was made for a, you know, five-minute routine, it was Let It Go. I mean, there's just so much you could do in there, and it would just... But besides that, all right, so, Thanksgiving, positive speech, no one fell. And I praise the Lord, because, you know, when they, they only did... Anyway, they shouldn't have fallen. That's all I'm going to say. We get there. And Stella's just excited to go. Like, so excited. And we get out of the car, and I know something's wrong. I got the two kids. Because you know how we are. We're always right on time. And so, you know, we didn't factor in the time to walk. And so Stella's getting out of the car. She's crying. And Beth said, she's had an accident. And, and we didn't bring any extra clothes. And we're like, oh, man. You know, and we're all like, surely they might, they sell some sort of pants in there. You know what I mean? Like we can, we can take out a loan and buy some clothing from the vendors at the Disney on Ice place. Well, anyway, so she gets out of the car and we're like, okay, well, we, we can make this work. We got a jacket. And then she starts walking to the, um, we're walking to the Civic Center. She's walking like this, like this fast. And, and Beth says, you know, and we're low-key like, oh, 
And Beth's like, no, you can't walk like that. We have to go. And Stella says, I got to go. And we're like, how? You've already went. And then we find ourselves between two vehicles. And then she's, you know, going in the parking lot. And, <laughs> and it hit me, this moment of, of gratitude. I don't know if this ever happened to you guys, where you're just like, and you just kind of look at the whole scene. And you look at Beth, and you look at Stella, and you got Bennett and Sutton. And it would just hit me as like, man, you know, it's so cool to be able to, like, have these kids and to carry them here. And, you know, to be able to say, hey, guys, we're going to walk by Stella's P-spot on the way back to the car. That's where it happened right there. But I think sometimes being a Christian and gratitude, that's the kind of the way it is, right? Sometimes it, that's when it hits you, is when you're kind of in the moment, everything's wet, there's no clothes, there's just nothing's right, but you can, the Spirit comes and He just opens your eyes in the moment, and you have inexplicable gratitude for God's gifts and God's blessings. I think that's what you see when you read the book of Ecclesiastes. You know, that poor guy, it's pretty dreadful, except for when it breaks in and he goes, I considered that all this was a gift from God to enjoy, and it's probably the best thing that a human could do is to actually labor and enjoy the gifts that God gives them. I think that's kind of the way it works when, when you're a Christian. And when, you're, when you look at passages like this, is, is there's actually, when everything seems like it's just, you know, and you're squatting between cars, there's, there's a moment where there is gratitude, and there's thanksgiving, and there's joy for the things that we think are making it stressful, right? Like one another. And we can actually give thanks to God for the blessing of having each other. And in those moments, right, that illustration, the story of Stella, is its own sort of death, burial, resurrection story. It's the, the hurry up to death, the moment, nothing's gonna, everything aborts, this is all wrong. We, you know, we're gonna have to go back home and we've spent all this money to go and we can't even go to the potty when we're supposed, and then it's just, in a moment, it's like, boom. Resurrection happens. It's inexplicable. It comes out of nowhere. And then you go in and you watch them skate. And you watch your kids smile, right? That, that's, that's what this is. That, that's what life is. That's what life as a Christian is. It's those, and it's, and it's the striving to, to simply just allow things to be and to have the moments where we're filled with the Spirit and it overflows with gratitude. And that's what happens. That's what can happen in the church if, if we take passages like this seriously. If we take them seriously and go, okay, I can give that person freedom to be. And, and, and suddenly, something takes its place there. The, the law that we want to impose from Sinai to get everybody to think what they should think, a bunch of blockheads, why can't they do anything right, like that actually begins to manifest itself in the people as the Spirit works and, and as it's the gospel is lived out in their lives. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I want to commend you, church, for just being who you are, for volunteering, for loving this place. We are blessed to have a lot of people here with different backgrounds, former Catholics, former Baptists, former Methodists, um, former Church of Christ people. Um, and, and some of you still may hold close to some of those affiliations. So I say former Baptist, you might think, well, I'm basically still a Baptist. I might say former Church of Christ, well, I'm basically still a Church of Christ. But I want to commend you all for being able to be in one space, right? Because we have some moments where the kids soil their pants. And you maybe wouldn't experience those exact moments if you were, you know, in a uniformity kind of situation. But this situation is one of those where there's a deep reliance on the Holy Spirit, on his transformative power, on um, his ability to comfort and exhort and to encourage and to, and to bring joy. And I just want to commend you guys for being so kind to one another and being loving to one another and growing in this and doing this relatively well. Um, Christ died 
It's one of the benefits, the, one of the blessings of his bloodshed is that he died for this to be a means by which we grow. We grow in our, you, you know, um, our unanimous praise to the Lord. And as we just maybe start here and here and we get closer and closer as we go into the one who's the head, right? The head, he's at the top. And so everything funnels and it just, and it's all relative as to when. But um, I do feel like it's necessary for me to commend you for what you've done to the Lord and to his grace for what he's gonna do in the future and to end with an invitation um, to sinners that God has welcomed you in Christ Jesus. That's one of the most <laughs> jaw-dropping realities is that somehow God welcomed me in Christ. You can't find anybody more different from God than me. But the message of the gospel is that, is that in Christ, God welcomed me. While we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. That's remarkable. That's a remarkable thing he's done. And what it means is there's, through repentance and faith, there's nothing that's now separate, that's, there's nothing that, you know, once you come to Christ, there's nothing that separates you from him. All the things that were in the middle that made you differ, that made you think, well, he'll never accept me. He'll never love me. He'll never forgive me. He'll never give me another chance. Why would he entrust me with this? All that's removed from by the cross, by the power of his blood. It, it's removed as far as the east is from the west. Their sins are drowned in the bottom of the sea. And all that's left is this um, companionship and fellowship with God that we get to experience as Christians. And if you're not a Christian, I, my, my invitation and my hope and prayer is that you'll become one, that you'll repent of your sins and that you'll, you'll believe on Christ Jesus and receive eternal life in a place um, an inheritance among those who are sanctified uh, by grace through faith in his great name. Let's pray together. Lord, we're thankful for your word and its ability to build us up. We pray that you would help us live it in our lives, that uh, we would be submissive to it, that it would be transformative, that it would um, transform our hearts, and that we would all, even though we're different, even though we don't all believe the same thing, we, we would all with one voice glorify you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.